Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our weekly tour learning of inspiring and bringing more light into the world. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how God's going to give to us. Please give generously so Hashem can give you generously. We're going to put a couple of coins in the tzedakah box. We're also dedicating this class in merit for the complete Rafua Shalema for Rafael Chaimer Ben Timachacha, Hanalei Sarabat Peshagito, Dvorle Bat Yafaliba, Bela Bat Chaya, Rezel Bat Hadas, Yosef Iskak Ben Bela, Yosef Ben Dvora Lea, Hana Yantarifka Bat Shindo, Rachel Bas Chaya, Yuta, and all everyone that needs. Uh, this class we're dedicating in memory of Rasha Bas Shaya. Uh, her yard site is the second day of Sukkot. May our neshama have the highest aliyah. We are now going to hear from Shandy Jacobson, share a story about her mother. She shared on um, a past class two years back, and we're going to share it tonight and conclude with a video. So please um, do something in her memory. It's a very auspicious time of year now. We're just literally uh, embarking upon the new year, and Haya asked me if I would share a, a story about growing up and a story connected to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And I have a, I did share a story recently, but this story that I want to share today, that one was a personal story, but this one is really even more personal. And what's interesting is that this is a story that happened 55 years ago. No, I'm sorry, not 55, uh, 53 years ago, 52 years ago, I should say, I'm sorry. It happened 52 years ago, and it's a story that has had such a ripple effect for the past 52 years that I, I even find it difficult to believe that it happened so many years ago. So the story goes back to when I was a little girl, I was seven years old. I grew up here in Crown Heights in a wonderful, beautiful, happy, warm family. And everything was beautiful and wonderful. I'm the youngest of five children. We were happy, we loved life, we rejoiced. We knew nothing else, that's the truth. And when my mother was a very vibrant, beautiful, very, very busy woman. She was never too tired or nothing was ever too difficult for her. She was involved not only in raising her family, but in helping my father in a new business and in the community and in the different aspects of communal work. And everything was great. And one day she began to feel very, very tired. And she said, oh, I'm so tired. And my father said to her, maybe you should go to a doctor. And she said, no, no, I'm doing so many things. Of course I'm tired. And this went on for a little bit of time until she started to see some very ominous signs. And she decided to go and see a doctor. And she came to a doctor. Don't forget, this was over 50 years ago where medicine was not nearly as advanced as it is today. She appeared in this doctor's office. He took one look at her and he immediately knew that she was extremely ill. And without telling it to her in so many words, he played along and he did some tests. And then he called her and my father and he said to them that she is extremely ill. She is suffering from acute leukemia and they will do whatever they can, but it's very, very far gone and they don't know what they'll be able to do. And so, of course, as Jews, we believe that you do whatever you can to prolong life. They gave her some treatments. Of course, the treatments were basically almost worse than the disease itself. And from the moment that she was diagnosed with this terrible illness till the moment she passed away, what took only six short weeks. And in six weeks, this vibrant, beautiful 37-year-old mother of five children passed away. She passed away on the second day of Sukkot, of the holiday of Sukkot, which we're going to be celebrating after Rosh Hashanah. We have Yom Kippur, and then we have Sukkot. Now, I hope that nobody here has to ever know these laws of Judaism, the laws of Jewish mourning, but when a person passes away on a holiday 
that is established as a holiday of two days, and then there are several intermediary days, and then there is the rest of the holiday. The two holidays like that are the holiday of Sukkot, that we have the intermediary days, and then we have Shemini Atzeret and Simchas Torah. And Pesach, Passover, is also like that. So the law is that you bury the person as soon as you can. That would be as soon as the first intermediary day, as soon as the first two days of the holiday are over. But the family, the next of kin, does not sit Shiva until the entire holiday is completed. So very, very sadly, the first two days of Sukkot passed. And on the first day of Hol HaMoed, of the intermediary day, my mother's funeral was held and she was laid to rest. But we still had to keep on living and keep up the rest of the holiday and then get through Simchas Torah. And only after that were we going to sit Shiva. Now, what happened was in those years, this was in the 1960s. Those of us who are aware of what was going on in different parts, not only of New York and Brooklyn, but in other parts of the world as well. What happened was that at that time, Crown Heights, somebody, one, it all began with somebody one day came out of the subway system and was mugged and was unfortunately murdered. And people became terrified and they started to run away from the neighborhood. And basically within a short time, all the people who were able-bodied and who were, had some means, they all moved away to other neighborhoods. And who was left here? The people who were, ail who were ailing, who were infirm, or who didn't have two nickels to scrape together. And at that time, the Lubavitcher Rebbe made a cry, a call, and he said, please, please don't run, don't leave. You're gonna run and the same thing could happen in a couple of years somewhere else. Let's all band together and try to keep up this community and especially even more than our community, the surrounding neighborhoods, which were really turning into slum areas very, very quickly. And the Rebbe said, all able-bodied young men, instead of walking to your regular shul on Shabbos and on holidays, our shul will survive because there are enough people here to keep up the minion. Go to shuls that are around the communities and dive in over there and bring joy to the Jews there so they'll at least be able to keep up their prayers. So my father, like everybody else in the community, he would walk to different shuls and he became almost like adopt a shul. He and a group of friends, they would walk to a particular shul in what is known as East Flatbush. As a little child, I thought it was miles and miles away from my home. I got a little older, I realized it was only about a 20 minute walk. And my father would go there on a regular basis to daven there. For special days, like on a holiday, on a Yom Tif, he would take along his children. In retrospect, I realized he did that because it was obviously much easier for him to go without his children. He could walk faster, it would be simpler. Why did he take us? He took us because he real we realized later it was it was a matter of education. He was educating us to show us that this is what you do. When you are able, you go and you do something for someone else. You help someone else. Even though you can daven in your own community and nothing will happen, but these people, if you won't go help them, it will fall apart. Nobody else will care. And so here we are. It's the second day, Erev, right before the second days of the last days of Sukkot. My father had just buried his young wife. Here he is, a widower, age 40, left with five children, ages seven to 16. And what does he say? He says, this Simchas Torah is not going to be different than any other one, because this is what a Jew does. God said you're supposed to be happy today. We're all going to get dressed in our most beautiful holiday clothes. We're going to walk as a family to East Flatbush like we always do. And we're going to bring the joy of Simchas Torah, dancing with the Torah to the Jews over there. And I will never forget how my grandmother, my mother's mother, who God bless her, was an amazing woman and had the strength of character. She made sure that we were all dressed perfectly, that we had our bows in our hair to match our clothing and we had our shiny shoes on. And we, my father took us by the hand I remember I was the youngest, I held one of his hands, my brother who was two years older than me held his other hand, and all of us walked to East Flatbush with a group of other people as well. 
and we came into the show and it was as a little girl it was very exciting it made me forget about the tragedy that had just happened a few days ago and the festivities were in full motion they gave out goodie bags to the children and they gave out flags and they started to sing and they started to dance with the torahs and it was very very festive and very very beautiful now as in appreciation to the hasidim who had walked to east flatbush they would always make a special hakaf for one of the seven dances they would dedicate it to these Lubavitcher Hasidim who walked to bring joy to this community. And they get, called them up and they gave them each a Torah and they led this particular session of dancing. And my father was one of the people that was lucky enough to hold a Torah and he was dancing. And I remember dancing next to him and it was just a party. It was so much fun. And while all this was taking place, Unbeknown to us, there was a 14 year old young boy who lived in East Flatbush, who was a member, he and his family were members of this little show, which was in danger of falling apart. And in the middle of this dancing, he tapped his father on the shoulder and whispered into his father's ear the following. He said, Dad, who is that little man that is dancing with the Torah in the middle okay. of the circle? He must be he said he must who is this little man dancing in the middle of the circle with a Torah? He must be the happiest man in the world because I never saw somebody dance with so much happiness. And at that point, his father took him to the side and he told him quietly, you see that man that's dancing? I want you to know that a few short days ago, he lost his wife, a 37 year old woman who left five children. And the boy said, that's dad, that's impossible. How could that be? How could somebody be so happy under such circumstances? And his father said to him, well, you see, this is what a Jew does. God said, you must rejoice on this holiday. God said so. It's a holiday of rejoicing. You don't ask questions. You do what you have to do. And if you're a chassid, you really don't ask questions and you just go above and beyond. And that's why he's able to do it. Now, we would have never known that this exchange took place. We finished the hakafot. We finished the dancing. We had a little party that made l'chaim. And we went and we trudged back to Crown Heights. And we continued the festivities. There's a lot more to the story that took place that night. But what I really want to tell you is what happened afterwards. Thank God. God was very, very good to us. My grandmother was an amazing woman. My father was an amazing man. We grew up. I like to believe that we grew up at least halfway normal. I don't know. I hope so. Thank God. God blessed us. We all married beautiful, wonderful people and raised our own families. Thank God every moment. 20 years after this story happened, 20 years later, the following story took place. In Crown Heights, there is an organization based here, but it's all over the world. It's called Sivos Hashem. And it is the largest Jewish children's organization in the world. And what it does is it just does things to help Jewish children be proud. All kinds of programs from making ranks, to studying things, to being part of a Jewish club, to going on Jewish trips. Now, in the last X amount of years, there is a very beautiful Jewish Children's Museum in Crown Heights, a huge building that is all part of this organization. And one of the things that they do is they help Jewish children celebrate and create programs everywhere. Well, 20 years after this story happened, a telephone call came into this organization and a young man answered the phone call and there was a person at the other end who said the following. He said, sir, I understand that your organization helps put together programs for Jewish children. Would you be able to help me? I'd like to make a program for Jewish children this coming Simchas Torah. And this young boy said, sure, tell me all about it. Tell me what you need, where you are, and I'll help you arrange it. So he tells him, I live in this and this town on Long Island, and I just bought a home here. And it's a very Jewish community, but this is over 30 years ago. 
there are there is very little Judaism here for Jewish children. And I would like to make a program for them for some Hustola. So he said, okay, how many children are you expecting? He get, took all the information. And when he finished, he said, okay, I'm going to organize it for you. I'm going to send you some young boys to help you. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. I'm just curious, why are you doing this? Do you have a Talmud Torah? Do you run a Hebrew school? Are you a youth director? And this young man said, no, none of the above. So he said, then why are you interested in making programs for children? He said, because something happened in my life 20 years ago. And that night I made myself a promise that when I am able, I will have the means, I am going to make a program for Jewish children to bring them joy on Simchas Torah. And now in my life, I am finally able to do this. So this person was so intrigued. He said, do you mind if I ask you what you saw 20 years ago? And he said, sure, I'll tell you. I was a young boy, I was 14, I lived in East Flatbush, and he told him the whole story. And he said, my father told me that this is what a Jew does. Even under such duress, under such tragic circumstances, this Jew still wanted to bring joy to Jewish people on some Hastola. So I made myself a promise that when I am able to, this is what I'm going to do. This person was so touched. He said, by the way, do you remember the name of the man that came to dance with you? And he said, yes, because I asked my father and my dad told me his name was Mr. Gonsberg and I wrote it down and now I am married. I have a computer business that's very, very successful. I got married, I have a home and a business and this is what I wanna do. Now the young boy who heard this story was so excited. He knows our family very well. He took care of all the organization he called my dad and he said to him, you will never believe what happened today in my organization. And he told him the story. When my father heard this, he was so, so moved. He called each of us and he said to us, this is what happens when you go and you do something because God told you to do something to be happy. You don't only do it for yourself, but you do it for somebody else as well. I could have very easily especially in my condition i could have said i cannot go to east flatbush this year it's too tragic i'm too sad i can't do it but i refuse to give in to that and look at the fruit of what happened from that he said we cannot let this pass so after that some hastola when this man had a beautiful program my father was connected back to him we our entire both of our extended families got together we made a beautiful evening for all of us together. We are still connected. We go to each other's events, simhas, celebrations, all because a Jew cared enough to share the joy of Yantif, of a holiday, with somebody else. So I really want to say the following, that no matter what, we really never have a reason to say I am not the person that can do an act of goodness and kindness. I have an excuse. We all have excuses all the time. I know my head is full of them all of the time. But if we just get out of our heads for a drop, for a minute, especially now, it's before Rosh Hashanah. You know, tonight is actually begins the 25th day of Elul. And the 25th day of Elul according to the Torah, is the day that God created the actual world. The world of God decided, there's a discussion, there's a different views, if it's God, if it was God's thought process that began on the 25th, and he decided then to create it on the 1st, or if it was actually in physical creation, and he culminated on the 1st, but this is the time period that we're in, when God was busy creating the world, and creating all of the, all of the opportunities like Shavi said, how creative we can be in order to take these messages and really, really pay them forward and make sure that the rest of the world understands that with one tiny act of goodness and kindness, we can change the world because one times one times one, it's exponential. It's unbelievable what we can do. So I want to wish everybody, we should be able to do this. It should never, ever, ever again for any human being to have to come through tragedy. It should only come through goodness and kindness. It should come through happiness and it should always 
be with ease and with gladness of heart and with a lot, a lot of joy. So thank you so much. And may we all together be reunited with all our loved ones. May this Rosh Hashanah be celebrated by Jews throughout the entire universe, all together in Yerushalayim, in Israel, with all our brothers and sisters from across the world in pure joy and happiness. Let me wish everyone Shana Tova Ometuka. Simchas Torah is the Simchas Torah is the happiest day in the Jewish calendar. Jews everywhere celebrate in unbridled joy, dancing with the Torah deep into the night. But the year 1969, Simchas Torah, will forever remain etched in my memory. In Chabad, the custom is that the Rebbe instituted that Chabad Chassidim don't just celebrate in their own communities, but they go out on what is called a talucha. They walk to surrounding communities, sometimes an hour, two hours, three hours, to dance and celebrate with different shuls and synagogues. Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Gansberg, a famed chassid in Crown Heights, did exactly that. In 1969, Simchas he took his young children, five of them, and walked to a synagogue in East Flatbush to celebrate with them. And indeed, they began to dance, and then something jumped out at everybody. Rabbi Gansberg was dancing with such fervor and passion, it was impossible to ignore. Something was happening here. It was a 14-year-old boy in the shul, and he turns to his father and says, who is this man, and why is he dancing so? So his father whispers to him, this man lost his wife six days ago to a terrible illness. And you see these five children, a 16-year-old, all the way to the youngest seven-year-old, they are tragically orphans. They've lost their mother. How can he dance like that? And the father said, that's a Jew. That's a chassid. He digs deeper and finds superhuman strength that on Simcha's Torah, we don't succumb even to great tragedies. And we allow the deeper inner joy of the neshama of the soul to celebrate. The dancing finally ended. Rabbi Gansberg took his children back home to Crown Heights, dropped them off at his house, and then made his way to 770, the central synagogue headquarters of Chabad Lubavitch, where the Lubavitch Rebbe was leading a Fabrengen as he always did that night of Simchas Torah. Now he had the privilege to begin the songs at these Fabrengens. Between the talks, he would lead the song. And when the Rebbe finished speaking, suddenly Rabbi Gansberg burst out a famous Russian song, not water can drown us and no fire can destroy us. The Rebbe gave a look at Rabbi Gansberg, knowing fully well what had happened, and connected with him, stared at him, and jumped up from his chair and began dancing. Eyewitnesses say, like they never saw the Rebbe dance again. And the whole synagogue was dancing with Rabbi Gansberg in his agony and his pain, but in tremendous celebration of St. Christopher. Fast forward, 20 years later, a phone call comes in to Sivas Hashem. This is the organization that organizes events for Jewish children. Man is on the phone and he says, Simchas Torah is coming and I'd like to sponsor a program for children. It's an interesting request, so the person on the phone asks him, why are you doing this? What's motivating you? He says, 20 years ago, I was a 14-year-old boy in an East Flatbush synagogue and there was a man, Rabbi Gansberg, that came in with five children. And I never will forget how he danced. And I remember what my father told me. They had lost his wife. And there I saw his children. And I said to myself that the day will come when I can afford to sponsor an event for children. And that day has come. I know the story, not only growing up in the community, but on a personal note. Because several years later, in 1983, I married that seven-year-old girl, the seven-year-old youngest child, Shandy, 
who went to that synagogue in 1969 with her father. That night in 1969, Simchus Torah, one of the most powerful lessons that you'll ever hear that Rabbi Gansberg personified and demonstrated was, we don't control the circumstances, but you can control how you navigate these circumstances. The worst thing can happen, but you have the choice to dig deeper and find a reservoir of eternal strength, and that is stronger and more powerful than the greatest darkness. And when you access that, that light dispels the darkness and the joy is more powerful than the greatest tragedy. I want to wish everyone a happy and amazing year ahead and you should be joyous as Sukkot. And when you're dancing with the Torah, think about Shandy and her family and her father and her mother. May he, may, may, they, may both her mother and father, uh, we, we married to see them so soon with the coming of Mashiach, Mashiach Rasha, Bashaya. And um, just always remember that happiness breaks through boundaries, enabling what is lacking at present to be granted. That's a quote from the Rebbe. Good night, everyone, and uh, Chag Sameach.